The patient is a 64-year-old male with a significant past medical history of atrial fibrillation. He was diagnosed with AFib in 2003, underwent his first AFib ablation in 2004, but shortly afterwards developed sinus node dysfunction. He had a pacemaker placed in 2006 and was started on Sotalol, but yet he had more atrial fibrillation and underwent a second ablation in 2008. For nine years, he did well, but in 2017, developed more atrial fibrillation persistently and has been in AFib for the last seven months. Uh, I saw him in clinic, we discussed treatments, and we've decided on another ablation. The electrode vest is placed on the patient in the pre-procedure area. The vest is connected via cables to the workstation and unipolar signals are evaluated to assure good quality. The patient today presents an atrial fibrillation. In order to use the AF signal for phase map analysis, we need to collect the atrial signal void of QRST segments and be of a duration of at least 850 milliseconds. Sometimes this requires administering AV nodal agents during the acquisition period, such as verapamil. Our goal is to collect between 15 and 20 separate segments. The cumulative amount of AF for analysis will be approximately 15 seconds. Once we have acquired the necessary amount of electrical data, the workstation is detached from the vest and the patient is taken to the CT scan. The CT scan can be performed with or without contrast and must cover the width and length of the vest. We typically use contrast in the AF cases as we also use the same scan for segmentation of the atria for our invasive mapping systems, either Precision or Cardo. The patient is brought to the EP lab and carefully defibrillator pads, ECG electrodes, and precision patches are placed under the vest in areas to try and minimize the loss of vest electrodes. While the patient is being prepped for the invasive procedure, segmentation of both the vest electrodes and the atria are done. Each electrode is identified to define the heart-torso relationship. Both atria are then segmented and the valves identified. Currently, there are two categories of non-invasive mapping that can be performed. One is single beat mapping. The second category of mapping is phase mapping, and that is what is being done today for atrial fibrillation. All signals from each collected segment are viewed to assure adequate signals, and channels can be removed if they are inadequate. Each collected segment becomes an individual phase map. Each phase map is then analyzed. The reconstructed unipolar electrograms are manually scanned around the core of an apparent rotational activity to confirm or refute its presence. A rotational activity is defined by at least 1.5 rotations around a two centimeter region. Focal activity can also be seen by centripetal activation from a central location. Once all individual phase maps are analyzed, all the rotational and focal activity are combined to create a composite map. This composite map will be used to guide our procedure. While the phase maps are being processed and analyzed in the control room, I'm starting the invasive procedure. In this case, we want to perform high density mapping of the atrial fibrillation to identify fractionated activity in both atria and then compare it to our rotational maps. I am using a grid catheter which has 16 tightly spaced electrodes to both construct the geometries of the chambers as well as to collect electrogram information for voltage and fractionation mapping. For our fractionation map, we are looking at a window of 350 milliseconds prior to a detected ventricular beat. Once a threshold is reached, signals within the 350 millisecond window are detected and counted. We are trying to identify the most fractionated areas in both atria and compare it to the rotational activity detected by CardioInsight. Our color spectrum on the fractionation map is that the white represents the most fractionated areas. 
Once we have completed the geometry and collected the intracardiac electrical information, we then review our maps as a team, take into account the patient's clinical history, and an ablation strategy is then developed. Okay, I want to recap what we've done at this point. Uh, after access, we've done some extensive intracardiac mapping to look for areas of fractionation. But while I, I was getting access and uh, uh, putting catheters into the heart, uh, we had already done the phase mapping data collection prior to the patient coming into the lab. Uh, uh, Sarah has created composite maps of the, with the phase maps. And prior to me starting the ablation procedure, I want to review this and come up with a strategy. So we'll, let's take a look at the maps and uh, Sarah will tell us what she sees. So right now we're looking at the posterior LA. Uh, what we found is two main areas of rotation. One in the inferior LA down here and a second on the sort of posterior RA septal area. And if I rotate this around to the anterior side, you'll see we're not showing many rotations there at all. We'll now look at what we've seen intracardiac, and uh, Javi will, will show us on the precision map. We didn't see anything that we really liked in the right atrium. We did see a little bit out in the coronary sinus. So in front of the left uh, pulmonary veins, which has a common ostium, uh, the ridge in between the left atrial appendage and the left veins, uh, we saw a great area of interest there just based on fractionation. Then the posterior wall um, sh sort of shifted over towards the right, uh, superior and right inferior pulmonary vein. Uh, the other spot that we saw was actually on the roof of the left atrium, anterior and I've been between the roof of the veins and coming out anterior, mid towards appendage. And then the last spot that we saw was on the left side uh, on the septum, sort of below the fossa valis uh, here and um, sort of adjacent to the septal coronary sinus, uh, the right atrium. Uh, so those are the four areas that we came out with using our high density mapping catheter and uh, just purely of fractionation mapping. With this data, what are we going to do? Uh, the patient has had a prior PVI twice and has had a roof line. His last ablation was 10 years ago. So some of where the fractionation areas are are close to where uh, currently, I would ablate for PVI. His level of isolation is a little bit more distal than what I would, um, would do now. So I think the ablation strategy is going to be re-isolate the veins in a more antral lesion. He'd had a previous roof line. That's an area where there was fractionation. So I will cut through the, the roof line. And then after that, I'm going to target the rotations that we see on the Cardio Insight map. And uh, with that, we will uh, hopefully uh, change the rhythm to, um, to sinus rhythm. Step one of our strategy is to re-isolate the pulmonary veins and reinforce the prior roof line. We started the ablation on the left pulmonary veins in an antral approach. The level of isolation actually is located at the same location as some of the most fractionated areas. So we ablated this region as part of the isolation. Ablation was performed with a tacticath catheter and we used a point by point approach as opposed to dragging for ablation. We used 30 watts for each ablation except on the posterior wall where we used 25 watts. We attempt to get between 10 and 20 grams of force for each ablation and use an FTI of 400 gram seconds as our endpoint for each lesion. After the left pulmonary vein ablation, we reinforced the prior roof line, which was next to another fractionated area. The right pulmonary veins were also re-isolated. Now what I've displayed up here is both the precision map as well as the cardio insight map. And one thing that's very helpful is to have the two maps 
side by side. Uh, with Cardio Insight, we have no navigational ability, but so we need navigation. So I need to place the catheter on the uh, precision site where the rotations are on the um, on the precision. So we're going to put the ablation catheter in that area. Step two of our strategy is targeting the rotations. So what I'm doing with this rotational area is um, I, I'm going to put a cluster of lesions in that area to, and my goal is to eliminate the electrograms. Um, if I can't eliminate all the electrograms then I I hope to homogenize it such that it's just being passively activated. But I'm doing a cluster lesion around what I think is the epicenter of that rotational area. Now we are moving to the second site of rotations. This is located in the right atrium. Please note the change in rhythm as this second region was ablated. Okay, I wanted to kind of update you. Uh, we first targeted the, the rotations on the posterior wall of the left atrium near the coronary sinus. Uh, we did that, that was unchanged. We did some additional lesions within the coronary sinus. Uh, and then we, now, after that, we then targeted our second area of the, uh, the rotations. And this was located in the right atrium on the um, sort of the posterior lateral part of the right atrium. And uh, it's displayed here on the Cardio Insight map here with the biatrial model. So we started targeting ablation in this, uh, and you can see on NAVX the area that corresponds to that. And as we were ablating, the patient goes from atrial fibrillation to this atrial tac uh, rhythm, maybe flutter. We haven't mapped that yet. Um, but uh, this was a great example of when we, we targeted the, the, um, the rotations and we had conversion out of AFib. Step three of our strategy is targeting atrial tachycardias and atrial flutter. Once the rhythm is organized, traditional mapping techniques such as entrainment mapping and activation mapping can be performed and these tachycardias can be ablated. Step four is confirmation. The final step in the ablation procedure is that in sinus rhythm, we confirm the integrity of all linear lesions and pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, we started, our step one was to re-isolate the pulmonary veins uh, more anterally than he had back in 2008. We redid the roof line. Uh, at that point, we then started targeting the uh, rotations from the Cardio Insight system. We started with the posterior wall of the left atrium near the coronary sinus, and then we moved on to the uh, second area. The second area was in the right atrium on the uh, um, uh, posterior lateral aspect of the right atrium, uh, very close to the septum. And as we ablated that area, uh, he converted from AFib to isthmus dependent, typical flutter, and then we ablated the flutter. Uh, so this is a very good case, and uh, we've wrapped up, we've confirmed isolation of the veins, we've confirmed block across the uh, roof, block across the CTI line, and uh, so we're done. Very good case. Thank you.